Hey guys, this is Melissa with Love Covered Life, and today I'm going to be doing a book review of this book, Her Gates Will Never Be Shut by Bradley Jerzak. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel, and don't forget to hit the like button and talk to me in the comments. So the point of this book, according to the back cover, is to take an honest look at what the Bible and church fathers actually had to say about the subject of hell, about universalism versus eternal conscious torment, or what Brad refers to in this book as infernalism. Brad Jerzak considers himself a hopeful universalist, and he refuses to say one way or another whether or not God will save all people in the end, which is a viewpoint that he considers presumption. But he leans strongly towards the hope in the final reconciliation of all. Even though I personally am convinced of the final reconciliation of all things, I appreciate his viewpoint for the very reason that he's more conservative than I am. He looks honestly at the difficult texts, he allows them to say their worst, allows the possibility that some texts do warn against infernalism, and then still manages, without dimming down these texts or reinterpreting them in light of universalism, to still find overwhelming reason to hope in the final reconciliation of all things. And the fact that he does this makes his conclusion even stronger than if he had gone through the Bible and just tried to interpret everything in light of universalism. Because then when he still, in spite of allowing the possibility of eternal conscious torment, still manages to bring everything back to an unwavering hope in God's mercy, well, it's a really powerful journey that he takes you on in this book. The book is divided into three sections. In the first section, Brad delves into all the words translated hell and judgment in the Bible. So Sheol, Hades, the Abyss, Tartarus. He talks about the words translated punishment, eternal, and torment. He dedicates an entire chapter to the history, geography, and resulting traditions surrounding the word Gehenna, which is the word Jesus used in the New Testament that our Bibles translate hell. He quotes liberally from the Bible and extra-biblical literature to show the evolution of the meanings of these words, and the beliefs that developed surrounding them over time. In this first section, there is a wealth of historic information. For instance, I learned things that I did not know about the two traditions that developed surrounding the word Gehenna, the prophetic historic tradition and the apocalyptic infernalist tradition. Brad offers insight into which tradition Jesus was likely a part of when he used the word Gehenna and why. I also learned historic information that I did not know about the phrase, the lake of fire, used in the book of Revelation. As it turns out, the lake of fire, like Gehenna, is a literal geographical location which came to be understood in ancient Jewish literature as symbolic for divine judgment. I'm really looking forward to diving more into this topic after I do my own research, so that's all I'm going to say about the Lake of Fire for now. In part two, Brad quotes liberally from the Church Fathers to show the evolution and variation of ideas on hell and the afterlife from the early years after Christ until now. And again, I appreciate his honest look at both sides of the equation. He quotes the church fathers of both the universalist and the infernalist persuasion and shows where infernalism originated and how it progressed into modern evangelicalism. One thing that I found very interesting is that even though the church fathers held to a mix of views, according to Brad's quotes and summary in his book, Masses of Christians in the early years actually believed in post-mortem salvation. They prayed for the dead because they believed that people could be saved out of either hell or purgatory or whatever um, specific 
version of the afterlife they believed in because like I said, there was a lot of variation in beliefs in those early years. Even Augustine, who was the one who really developed the infernalist position, believed that people could be saved after death. And in my opinion, this is a really strong argument in favor of what Brad would call hopeful universalism because this is one of the commonly used arguments of evangelicals today against universalism. Well, if people can be saved after death, then what was the point of Jesus' death on the cross? If they can just go to hell and pay for their own sins. Apparently, this is actually a really bad argument against universalism because in early Christianity, according to Jerzak's summary in his book, the general attitude of most Christians was that we should hope and pray for people's salvation even after their death. Part three of the book deals entirely with the book of Revelation. So Brad goes through the final couple of chapters in the book of Revelation to point out the ordering of events. Brad shows how even after the kings and nations of the earth are sequestered to the lake of fire, Revelation actually ends with the call from the spirit and the bride from within the city. Come and drink! And it says that the gates will never be shut and that the kings of the earth, the ones who were previously sent to the lake of fire, will come in by the gates and that the leaves of the trees on the bank of the river of life will be healing to the nations. What nations? The ones that were previously in the lake of fire? That's just a brief summary. He goes into a lot more detail and ties everything in Revelation with Old Testament prophecies from Ezekiel and Isaiah, and it's really very fascinating. The book ends with a powerful word picture of the damned outside the gates of the city responding to the call, Are you thirsty? I'm going to read this to you because it was the most powerful part of the book for me, and I'm not going to lie. I was crying. I had tears running down my face because you know when you have one of those moments of epiphany like, oh wow, I've experienced this or this is something that I knew. That's what this moment was for me when I was reading this. Lost souls languish outside the gates of the great city, their thirst deepening as they fester in the smoking valley of Gehenna. Time has lost all meaning in this non-life of non-being. Lips and hearts are cracked with hopelessness like baked clay. Their time to choose has passed, their judgment just and certain, death eternal their lot. They cannot even make themselves care. And then an intrusive question forms in their hearts. Are you thirsty? Beyond ludicrous, the question reawakens the exiles to their torment and intensifies their thirst. Are you thirsty? They recall the pointless supplication. Have pity on me and send someone to dip a fingertip in water to cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. Hopeless. But the question has begun its work. Hearts gaze longingly at the city walls. The question has energized a plea. What if we trudged out a pilgrimage to Zion's gates to seek an audience with the king? What if, hope against hope, someone opened the gates? Even as the damned set their hearts upon the journey, while still a good distance away, the heart of God is already turned toward them. For the question originated from his throne. Christ, the river of living water, pours out of the open gates and into the valley of death. Streams flow into Gehenna where the green shoots spring up on widening banks. When I read this, it resonated so deeply with me like this is the deepest truth that I know. There is no such thing as hopeless. Hope, according to 1 Corinthians 13, lasts forever. So how can anyone call themselves a Christian and allow the word hopeless into their vocabulary? Hopeless is a prison we create with our own minds and we lock ourselves in from the inside. And isn't this the cycle that we see repeat over and over in this world? People imprison themselves in their own states of hopelessness to the point where they just can't bring themselves to care. The moment that we are willing to awaken, to believe, even just to hope to believe, even the tiniest amount, the light is waiting to break through. If we were to go knock on the doors of the city, we would find that they were never shut. As soon as we even think the thought, maybe God would open the gate, we find ourselves within our Father's joyful embrace. Of course, anyone who seeks God, even from the pit of hell, especially from the pit of hell, would be welcomed with open arms. 
I know this in my humanity. Are we saying that I, that we, are more gracious and loving than God? How could we ever believe anything else? And as to the subject of free will, and whether or not it is possible for someone from the pit of hell to seek God, Brad has this to say. It seems to me that absolutely everything in us that says no to perfect love and eternal salvation is not based in freedom, but in bondage. Brad is speculating that anyone who has a truly free will is going to choose God. The reason anyone would not choose God is because his will is enslaved. And Jesus came to release us from bondage. Jesus spoke of sin as something that needs healing, not punishing. And this is where we can place our hope. That Jesus is fully able to accomplish what he set out to do. The main takeaway from this book is that when we let the Bible speak honestly, and when we don't dim down the difficult passages. And I will say that some of the passages that Brad thinks could be used in support of infernalism, I actually think are pretty easy to explain in light of universalism. But even when we don't do that, even when we allow the difficult passages the possibility of saying the worst, there is still overwhelming and ample evidence to believe in the triumph of mercy over judgment in the end. In fact, this is what we are not only encouraged, but commanded to do. The Christian stance should be to hope for the reconciliation of all things. Even for those who are not convinced of it, should at the very least hope for it. Because the Bible says that love hopes all things, and that God's mercy endures forever. So even if hell endures forever, God's mercy endures forever too, and there is no such thing as no hope. Don't forget to talk to me in the comments, guys. Be loved, be happy, be at peace, and thank you for watching.